But for many different reasons, that's a very hard task because um, the BMC infrastructure is not a single chip. It has to deal with uh, communication with different um, FPGA, which are outside of the chip. And QMU is not that easy to, um, I would say, virtualize all of this interconnection between multiple chip. And I didn't really find um, an easy option just to implement that. So we've, I finally decided just to write a new piece of code and make it available to HP engineers just to uh, pursue our work around open source firmware. Um, I think the, 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 the main reason behind this was really how do we um, automatize remote build testing and release management of, um, of the BMC and the ROM firmware when using open source. So I think it's really critical. Um, so other than um, during the pandemic, we are facing a challenge when, when discussing with potential end users of open source firmware on HPE platform. How, do you, how, how can we safely validate that the firmware is properly set up? So how can we uh, help uh, the end user uh, to um, discover bugs without uh, breaking its own infrastructures? So the, the idea was really to build a tool which would be able to do that without having any kind of server at home or taking the risk to break your own systems. Uh, so we are currently focusing on two open source projects. One is called OpenBMC and the other one is called Linux Boot. So the CI that we are going to demo you uh, just after that slide is able to handle both of these projects. There are a couple of alternatives regarding the BMC, so, but um, uh, that's, that's the main principle. And uh, this has an impact directly um, related to the build process, but the, the CI tool by itself is able to execute any kind of firmware on an HPE platform, as long as it is built on top of Linux. So that's the, that's the key thing. Um, so we, we, we deployed the tool at scale. So we, we are currently using this tool inside HP and uh, outside HP. The demo is going to be run uh, through a system which is hosted directly on the internet. So you can open up an account and use the, use the demo straightforward just after that talk if you want to. And um, we took the decision to make it fully open source. And I think it was something which is critical because we really want to improve the, the quality of open source firmware and just being sure that people can start developing open source firmware uh, without investing thousands of US dollars into complex hardware infrastructure. And that's, uh, that's, the, uh, that's the other issue. So when you look at OpenBMC or all of these open source firmware related projects, you will be seeing that mainly the contributor are people who are working for massive companies which are deploying at scale this technology. And I think that when you are part of a, an open source community, even individuals should be able to uh, develop uh, the technology and, or at least learning about it uh, without to have uh, to invest, um, I would say, how is a saving bank uh, account into, into that. So that's also one of the benefits of, um, of this CI technology. So we called it OSFCI, Open Source Firmware Continuous Integration Platform. Um, that's, a, that's a website. We will go deeper into the technical detail after, after the demo. Arun is going to run the demo. Just to give you a, a quick feedback. So we are here in Austin. What we are going to show you is, um, I would say, an OpenBMC build, a Linux boot build, the deployment of the, uh, of the outcome of the build on, um, on a real system, turning on the systems and looking at uh, the outcome by staying into that room using the Wi-Fi networks with the, with the infrastructure hosted within a data center. And you could do that anywhere around the world and you can break the node and you can restart into uh, an, a known state without, uh, without any issue. So Arun? Yep. Let's cross our finger. This is demo time, so it might be failing. Hopefully, it is going to work. He's, uh, he's under heavy pressure, so he's under stress since yesterday night trying no, to, I, to be sure that the demo will be ready. So I think before we get kicked off, um, there's a bit of a background. Uh, when I first met John marie I was running my own startup. We were designing a firmware security analyzer. And during that course, he gave me a Winterfell note just to, as a loaner to try and take apart the BIOS, and so you literally have to 
take the chip apart with, with, a, with scotch tape, bring it out of the board, put it in a programmer, and rewrite. That was the workflow. So it's pretty, uh, and I'm from a security background, and I just got started in the firmware space, and it was pretty intense, right? Every time you have to do this stuff. Um, around that time, we were given a talk. He came up with the idea, okay, we can, we can um, sort of virtualize all this on real hardware using the EM100s, which is sort of the key break breakthrough, and it was an aha moment, right? So uh, it was wonderful that that workflow went away to where now you can do this on a beach. Now remember, you don't need our website to do this. You can set up your own um, instance, and you can even have your own scripts because all of the website is built atop APIs that we provision. Um, so you're able to do that. You can, you can uh, do that without having uh, the, the website. Now, the first part when you log into a screen is that you get a session and you pick which server targets you're going to do. For example, this one is currently running on a DL360 node. And um, you can sort of build your own. So I did a build. And it built, apparently. It says image successfully generated. And now I can just simply say load my firmware. When you generate the build, I don't know. So you just need to mention your, your GitHub path and the branch. And um, that, that is spinning out um, a Docker image. And you, you can see on the right-hand side the output of the Docker image directly of the build happening uh, on, the, um, on the CI infrastructure. So one of the main advantages, either you can, you can build on your local systems and drag and drop the firmware image to the CI, or you can use what we are providing as a compiler uh, backend infrastructures. Um, the compiler backend infrastructure is currently building in RAM, so we put a lot of RAM into the server. Uh, we put a lot of cores too. I think there is um, 196 cores or 192 cores into the, the build system. So it's a fast machine. So the the idea is that you you can you can build complex um, open BMC image or Linux boot image at a very fast pace. So. And the other great thing is that if you're using a compiler node and you want to take a copy of the image, you can download the image. Um, so all of that is also through API. Um, similarly, you can do the build. You can um, go for a BIOS build. In this case, in top, you saw that I was using my branch. In this case, I'm using Jean-Marie's branch, just trying to test something out. Apparently, this also worked. So let's try and load that. Let's load the BIOS. Hopefully, everything goes well. So when we say we load the BIOS and we load the OpenBMC image, so this is taking the, uh, the output of the build from the, the Docker containers. That's a binary file, either 32 meg or 64 meg. And this is moving this binary into an FPGA, which is faking the, um, the spy flash part on the motherboard. And that FPGA is directly connected to, uh, to the DL360 motherboard or the DL325 motherboard. And when we will be turning on the power, so roughly uh, the chipset is going to load the Canton directly from that FPGA. So that, that, that means that um, we, we do not need to remove the spy flash, put it into a programmer, and put it back into the, into the, the server. And the other great thing is that if you are um, in the process of um, doing your builds, you can actually s switch the power on and look at the system actually come up. So what you, what you see there is the, uh, the console output from the BMC of an HPE server. So the BMC is an SOC. It does incorporate um, one Cortex-A9 uh, core. And um, it's going to boot U-boot uh, and then uh, the Linux kernel and the open BMC environment. So this is like a cooking show. Um, so you can have a look at what happens afterwards. You have a system that was bought up. This is actually a private node running. So just as I explained, you can actually build your own CI uh, based on playbooks that are available. We are happy to help you out there as well. We're doing a bunch of work with OCP on the same front. Um, you can look to the console. Yeah, the, the, the console output that you, you see there is um, is an interactive one. So when the Linux kernel and the user space environment will be loaded, 
So we can type in the root password or any kind of user uh, pre-configured within the image, and you really can remotely do whatever you want. Uh, yeah, we have a question. Yes, this is, so this is real hardware. Yes. That is real hardware. This is not no. It's not QMU. That's real hardware sitting in Houston data center. So you have a special piece of hardware that can program it to while it's sitting on the board. We, we, got, we got a ton of specific piece of hardware. Uh, <laughs> just, I would say just a, a few tricks. So yes, we, we, we got that FPGA, which is faking the, uh, the flash pipe. That's a standard product. That's available. That's uh, from Dediprog. Right. That's uh, EM100. But we got, we got what we call into the infrastructure three, three kind of nodes. We got a compiler nodes, we got a controller nodes, which is controlling what's going on on the test systems. You basically built a, a DevOps system for OpenBNC. You're right. Pretty much. On, on HP platform. And it was really critical because I really didn't want it to keep my desk swapping the spy flash right. from my server under my bed. So that's the main reason. <laughs> But in the end, it has had some very good um, positive consequences. So I would say that the pandemic helped us to review our workflow when developing firmware. Um, I know that the pandemic has been a very sad period to many of us, uh, but we, we took that opportunity just to review, A, how can we work remotely? How can we uh, have a, a way much more efficient workflow when designing firmware code? So now the, the image is booted. Arun is just connected to the image. You can run a top comment, so you're under Linux, and, and you can check if your build um, is, um, is reaching the goal that you set up when you, when you build it up. Um, there are other um, funny features which are available, because you might be aware that BMC are, I would say, advanced are getting more and more advanced. So there, there is a web UI, there is um, a key VM console, so which means that uh, you, 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 you want to be able to test it. And how can we provide that? So the, the tool is also providing you access to the web UI of OpenBMC from the machine that, that you just turned on into uh, the Houston data center. I don't know if it's up and running Yeah, yet. it is running. Okay, um, so when it's running, you get the BMC button, which, uh, which is appearing into the, the, the web page. And so if you're like me, you never read documentation, right? So you just click on that if you're new to the tool, and it'll give you helpful tabs um, as to what all of this means. Um, so that's a little neat trick that you can do as you're getting acclimatized to the tool. Of course, if you're using the API, you just have to read the, the code, which is always good as well. Um, so as the joke goes, if the documentation disagrees with reality, trust reality. Um, <laughs> And so, as Jean-Marie explained, you can actually have a uh, web uh, interface into the BMC. So that's the Open BMC console that's triggered by this little button here. Um, so you can log in, just like I logged in on the shell. Hopefully, I remember the famous default password. Okay, so we got we got traction. The, the CI is designed to be scalable, so we can have multiple end users at the same time. So what is the unique things you get access to is your unique servers when you run your um, CI session. So you, you, ha you own your test servers. So we got the DS360 and DS325, so we can have two common end users at the same time. But your session is not going to be hijacked by the other end users. And that's about the same. You cannot hijack the session from the other end users. So there, if, you, if you notice, there's a time limit running up clock that shows you roughly the instance uh, availability that you have. Um, we are working quite a lot within the OCP contest, which is a bunch of hyperscalers. And within that contest, there are other test frameworks that we are supporting. So we've got early support coming in for a Meta's uh, contest. Um, so this is sort of an instance where you can uh, sort of run specific test cases that you're interested in on the SUT, and then you just hit run. And so it'll actually run. Again, all of this is programmatically available as well. You don't need the web um, piece to do this. You can set up your own, or you can talk to our APIs and, and have an auth key and do that. So once the test is run, you can actually just download the results. So that's, that's something that is happening right now within the OCP contest is, uh, context is that they are um, locking down on a specification for general open source uh, test frameworks and tests 
for, for hardware. The other thing that I would like to mention is that we are not locked into HP only. So you can write your own. The architecture is such that you can write for your own particular server or machines. I have friends who have tried um, doing this on a Raspberry Pi and other playbooks as well. Um, the last thing I would mention is that if you're running an instance and you can actually hook up an elastic node to kind of give you additional telemetry on how that instance is being used, so that is also possible. It's got a nice logger on the back end with uh, which I designed and wrote, and it's uh, extensible. You can use it as you build components and so on and so forth. So it is well instrumented. Can you just get back to the OpenBMC image? So I think. Is that the running server? Yeah, yeah. I think Let's so. Let's try to see that. I don't know if it's going to work, but yeah, you can you can get access to the 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 console of the host. So the BMC, as you you might be familiar with, is is just the infrastructure which is controlling the host. And when I'm, the host is um, is roughly the compute power of your servers. So in that case, the DL360 is a dual Xeon motherboard. Um, I think I never know the Intel code name or the, the name of the processor. That's a dual Xeon the Gen 10 is what? Oh, 926. Okay. <laughs> and and so we can turn it on and off. But what's also critical is when you are developing Linux boot is can you get access to the server console of the of the server? So the server has been turned on automatically when you start OpenBMC. And I'm currently uh, connected to the serial console of the host, not the BMC anymore. And you can check what's going on uh, at the BIOS level, at the ROM level. In that case, uh, the ROM is integrating um, as a UFI shell, a Linux kernel. That's the Linux boot implementation of, um, of, of a ROM. And uh, there is a user space which is integrated with that Linux kernel that is called, that is called Uroot. And that's a Golang-based user space. So it's there, and we I probably cannot do the machine because there's probably no bootable image, but let's try to do that. Oh, there's, no, there's nothing. So, but there, there is everything which is set up to boot up the, the systems, and you, you really can test everything from scratch up to, up to the end. So it's resetting right now because there is a timeout automatically. So you can see the Linux kernel coming back. So that's roughly it for the demo. But the, the main purpose of, of this tool is really to try to develop open firmware. I wouldn't say from an iPad or tablet or whatever, but it's really to push the automation up to the end and avoiding that we have to touch any kind of hardware or whatever happen. And that, that is the critical thing. So, oh, there is an operating system installed on that. <laughs> 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 so it has booted Linux. <laughs> So you can see an end-to-end -end solution. So we started from scratch. There was no firmware. We loaded OpenBMC that we just recompiled with Linux boot. We turned on the power. It started the, the, the OpenBMC image. It started the Linux boot image, and we put it into um, a regular Linux environment, which I think is based on Ubuntu. And I can switch off the machine. So that's, that's super easy in the end. You can also destroy the realm, quote unquote. Uh, yeah. So if something goes wrong, um, you, you're, uh, you're avoiding that uh, terrible thing where something is bricked, and then you'll have to, again, take it out, put another programmer, and reset, and so yeah. forth. So, so when you are done with your session, what you can do is you can disconnect the power. This is like removing the, the AC power supply from your server. So this is what you do when you break the node. <laughs> And um, I just disconnected the servers. The system is going to clean up everything for you. So you don't need to remove your own software and, and, and so on. And then either you restart uh, by downloading a new session, you have made a fix, and you recompile your image, and you, you go back through your testing process. Um, that's pretty useful when we develop the Linux kernel, for example. So we have to develop uh, device drivers, which needs to be tested on real hardware in some way. And uh, if the kernel crash, we can get access to the kernel log and so on. Each of these gray windows is a screen session. So you can, you can get access to the log of the screen session. So you can use the page up and page down options. 
So you really can get access to the whole log of the, of the boot process. And if you're wiring up your own instance, of course, you don't have to play by our rules. You can set up the timer for however long as you need and uh, cordon off access. So the, the website address is osfci.tech. So you can find the link within the browser just right here. It's public, so that's free of use. And you can, you can develop OpenBMC on GXP and HP platform. So we do not host currently, can I switch back to? Yeah. Um, servers for more competitors. Um, it makes sense, I think. <laughs> but uh, the technology can work with any kind of uh, x86 systems or uh, servers. So this was sort of backup in case everything went south. Um, we did a <laughs> bunch of slides so that um, it was some evidence. OK. So why do we think uh, it's critical? So first of all, it has fixed the issue we faced during the pandemic. So it took us about three months to build a proof of concept of this technology, and just being sure that we, we, we have all the building blocks which were required to make it work. Um, and um, we quickly discovered that by using automation at the firmware level development, um, we were way much more efficient. So because removing the chip, reprogramming it, putting it back, um, seeing some smoke coming up, because if you do not put it back in the right direction, you're just <laughs> shortcutting the flash chip and you need to refresh a new one. <laughs> it happens, trust me. Even to the most experienced engineers, it happens. It's probably happened to me a dozen of times. And I'm not saying I'm experienced engineer, I'm just getting old, so that's the, <laughs> that's the main reason. <laughs> that's a view issue, probably. <laughs> so uh, the, the, the thing is, the manual firmware development that we use during the past 20 years can be really accelerated by using an automated tool. And, um, and we also believe that this is enhancing the, uh, the hardware safety and the testing capability of the hardware. So we are way much more faster at enabling OpenBMC right now, or the Linux kernel on our GXP ASIC by using this kind of tools. We also offer the opportunity to our customers or end users to test OpenBMC and open source technology without all the hurdles uh, that, that it might be involving. And trust me, we, we have a very wide variety of customers. And when we launch a new functionality on our servers, some of them are really willing to testing it without even understanding what it could build. And when we tell them, oh, you need to remove that chip, try to refresh it and put it back, they say, OK, it looks like easy. And, but in the end, it's not really easy if you've never done it. So it's always better to have a tool uh, which could be common between us, the end users, and even the community. So my best case scenario currently is that we interface this tool with the GitHub repo from OpenBMC. And each time they are integrating uh, a pull request, this might be launching a build request on the CI and testing and validating on real hardware that that new pull request is not going to break everything on HP hardware. Um, I, ideally, I love to see that happening on all of our competitors' hardware because this is going to improve the OpenBMC code quality. And this is also going to um, ease the, um, the, the security test that is needed because uh, OpenBMC relies on Linux. So you can do whatever you want with that. Um, Linux is safe, but if it's not properly configured, you can open up TCP ports without even knowing that you open them up. And that might be a security threat. So we can automatize the testing regarding this. From a pure architecture perspective, so we wrote everything in Go. Uh, I was into my Go period when we started that project. So I'm learning a new language every five to 10 years. So yeah. <laughs> um, it was either C or Go. So I think Go is way much more uh, suitable for this kind of activity. Um, it's. Um, API driven, so you don't need to use the web UI just to use the tool. So you, you can use script and just make API calls. So the first call is open up the session, the second call is, is getting access to, to machines, and when you, you, your access is granted, you can start uh, compilations and, and loading your firmwares and getting, and getting the, uh, the outcome of the run. So I think that's an interesting uh, perspective. And the, roughly the, the web UI is built on top of the API call. So the web UI is a, is a single application written in, in JavaScript, uh, which is just running these API calls and, and, 
and displaying the, uh, the, uh, the output uh, through, uh, through the web UI. The source code is, um, is released under an MIT license. So if you want to contribute to the enhancement of the systems and the solution, feel free to do it. We yep. accept pull requests. Yes. We are the code maintainers. And, um, and we, we try to improve it on a, day, on a daily basis. We are using the, um, the exact same source code that is published inside HPE. Uh, it doesn't mean this is high quality. We discover bugs every day, so just to let you know. That's, that's a very, in some way, it's a new tool which has been developed in a rush mode. Yeah. So you can imagine that the source code is not perfect. <laughs> But uh, we try to improve it. That's also why we, we, we get that work um, shared with the, open, uh, with the open compute community. So we, we really were juggling when we decided to bring it to the open compute community because um, there was a debate about, hey, do we open up a project under the Linux Foundation umbrella or the open compute community? You know, when you design firmware, you never know where you are. Does I am a software guy or an hardware guy? It's pretty tough to know, and so, uh, because firmware is really the boundary between the, the software and the hardware. So there's plenty of work uh, if people are interested in terms of uh, what they can contribute. Um, you can contribute uh, to support new boards. You can contribute uh, to the stabilization of the code base. So we're going to be bunch, doing a bunch of work on the testing end for the CI itself. So um, all of those are opportunities. I think I dropped directly to the outcome slide, so but that's fine. Um, we really want to drive that project as a community-driven project. It's a very specific topic, but I think it's a very important one to scale up the adoption of open source firmware within the data center space, which is the main um, topic of interest that we have currently. Um, and um, and, and that's, that's really critical that this kind of tools emerge. And um, we didn't really find any kind of suitable tools up to now. Um, this was the last slide. We can enter a Q&A session. Um, I hope you enjoyed the talk. I hope you will be staying for the next one because we will be discussing you how our GXP ASIC works in some way, what's inside the GSP ASICs, what did we have to do regarding uh, supporting the Linux kernel on, on top of that, and what's the security impact regarding it. But let's stay on the CI up to now. Uh, is there any question? Ah, I'm pretty happy there is at least one. <laughs> oh, sorry. Okay. Um, so you chose to uh, have your CI building and your testing on hardware in the same service, basically. Yeah, that, that is true. Uh, we initially, the, the building part was not integrated into the CI. It was decoupled. We were building on our own systems. But OpenBMC is a very complex project. It's using Yocto. And um, our build environment was um, set up inside HP network, which is greatly configured for security. And building Yocto, um, images behind um, a proxy was a nightmare to me. I was getting upset every day because the proxy configuration was not really suitable for my needs. Or I must admit that I, I'm not a very good proxy and user um, because uh, th this is just creating frustration on my side. So, and um, I decided that I need, needed to find a way just to be able to recompile from a public machine. And, um, and I asked one of my colleagues, hey, give me a a real machine, put that into a data center, and like that I can, I can recompile open BMC. I don't want to spend my day fixing proxy issues. I'm paid to develop firmware, not fixing proxy issues. <laughs> and, uh, and this is how we ended up to integrate the, the compiler mode. But it's not needed in the end. So you, you, you really can supply to the CI um, a pre-compiled image. Yep. So roughly when you open up your session, you don't need inside the workflow to, to, to start by recompiling your image. You really can give a binary file, which is the, the ROM for the, for the BMC and, and the ROM for, for the host. You can even start without the ROM loaded for the host with a lot of limitation, because if you, start, if you try to start up the, the host, nothing is going to happen. There is no ROM available. But it's not going to kill the motherboard. I did the test 
just to be sure that uh, if we start with that, the ROM chip, what's going on? <laughs> so that's safe. So, and, and these are like Lego blocks, right? So we, we, our arrangement is not um, limiting you. You can sort of twist and play as, as you like. Just wait, I think the big ended up to another person. <laughs> um, just curious, how many uh, users does this support? Is it like one user per uh, board, or is it like multiple shells per, uh, per board? Or? OK, this, this is one user per board per session. So you open up a session, you got your board. So um, we, we got some queue happening on the public CI currently, but we are going to we, 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 are, we have the capability to increase the number of servers available. Um, so roughly the CI currently, the public CI is about 100 end users. Um, people that we do not know in some way. <laughs> they just registered and uh, they discovered the tool and they are part of OpenBMC community. They liked it or disliked it, I don't know, but they're still using it in some way. <laughs> so that means they probably liked it. Um, but, uh, um, the, the thing is, we can share the hardware between developers. That's the other key things. When but I'm sleeping, my server under my bed is turned off. Otherwise, I cannot sleep. So, and, even, and it's totally useless. So, even, even within HP, we have people that are donating her hardware. So we're growing that internal CI tool. Like someone said, oh, I want to donate this to you guys. Or uh, same thing's happening at OCP. So. Uh, it, you know, the architecture is such that you can expand it uh, as your usage grows. I think there was another I, question. Yeah, I think the next <laughs> here. Are you looking at um, doing a complete CI solution where somebody you know, checks in a patch or checks in something to get and it and the system automatically builds loads it on there and runs tests, is that, is that something you're planning to do? Ideally, that is what we are planning to do. Okay. Because I, so I, look, I look carefully at what OpenBMC is doing for the CI solution. I like it, uh, but many times it's based on QMU images. Yeah. Right. And I really think that when we deal with firmware and hardware, it needs to run on hardware. That's the end goal. Well, you need both, but yeah. yeah. You need both. I, I think they are complementary. Uh, that, that, that's really key that we run both. And right now, that's only QMU. And each time I tried to run something on QMU and ended up on real hardware, I was right. hurt, hurt by a few things that I forgot. So, and that, they are the critical ones in some way. Right. And that, that's why if we can automatize everything, so we, we, we can use the whole process. And then this is just a matter of how, uh, of having access to the, um, the right level of equipment. Luckily, we still have a lot of equipment. I'm not saying we have a dozen of unused servers, so, but we, we can easily have access to equipment because we are building up a lot of prototypes, and when we, we, we get our job done on the prototypes, we can reuse them for internal use case or CI use case. So that's, that system we cannot sell. Uh, sell. So either we scrap them or we, we reuse them internally for something else. Right. And the OCP are right now setting up their own OCP lab, which we are quite involved with, and we are sort of the primary CI for that. Um, so there will be a bunch of gear that's coming that way as well. Um, so I, I think the overall goal is, like you said, the ideal state is to have a GitHub action or similar and just point and click, and yeah, it's running. So that's where we want to go. So a lot of work ahead, a lot of fun ahead. Yeah. So you can, can you run this with QMU eventually? We, we could. Um, I still didn't have the time to implement a QMU, uh, I would say, version of the GXP ASIC for, for different reasons. So the first one, I, I need to get approval from uh, <laughs> many different people just to do that. <laughs> <laughs> I wouldn't expect you. That's, that's a tremendous amount of work. And, and the second thing, it's, it's a lot of work. And as long as I know I can test it on real hardware, I said, OK, I think the, 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 the OpenBMC community is testing on QMU, the kernel, and everything, the user space. So let's, let's stay focused on the, 
the HP specific things, okay, and but that's mainly re, uh, hardware related. How hard would it be to adopt put put QEMU into this instead of the real hardware? Is it set up where you you can plug in? Something I think different? it's super easy to 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 use a QEMU as a backend for testing. Okay, so that's yeah. that would be the big thing that I think Open uh, or OCP would be looking for. Yeah, yeah, and that's that's easy to do. Okay, and uh, you're looking at like a JTAG debugger tie-in. I'm trying to avoid to get to get to <laughs> So Nick Nick is taking care about that. Okay. Uh, he's, he's our kernel developer at HPE okay. for the BMC side. <laughs> so um, when, when I get a serious kernel issue, I'm just forwarding an email to Nick, and he's taking care about it. So that that's the beauty of trying to be a project lead. <laughs> and getting approvals is not a non-trivial uh, matter, as as most of you working in large. Um, context would would be aware of. Time's up. Okay. Th thank you very much, everybody. And for the one who wants to stay for the next talk, just stay in the room or have a quick break.